Hi, welcome to this Open Security Summit in July 2022. And this is very exciting because this is the first time since 2019 that we actually are doing an on-site one. We're doing all these virtual ones. Um, we're starting small. We, you know, the last on-site one was in Center Park, where we had 150 people uh, for five days. So now we, we're starting a bit small. And massive kudos to Petra because she's the one that actually nudged and says, let's do this and helps a lot. So, you know, this is our first panel. We're doing a lot of panels and we're going to do a bunch of working sessions later on. But uh, here's our first panel. Over to you. Hello. So um, I've got an interesting uh, set of panelists here, and we're going to talk about one of the most difficult things in cybersecurity, and that's hiring. Um, not just most difficult, but most stressful. So I'm going to get my panelists to introduce themselves first, and then I'm going to ask a couple of questions and see if we can find maybe some direction. Um, we're definitely not finding a solution today, but maybe we find some direction in this. Over to you. Cool. So I have two roles at the moment. I'm the chief scientist of Glasswall, and I'm the CISO of Holland and Barrett. So I'm Dida Gedici. Um, I'm a senior manager at Just Eat, looking at information security risk and compliance. Hello there. I'm Marius. I'm the CISO of Job and Talent. Hi, and I'm uh, Manos. I'm the head of information security here at Zaza. Thanks for having me. And I'm Petra, I'm the Senior Security Engineer in Job and Talent, and I'll be the moderator for today. So um, I'm going to start with Didar and ask already a little spicy question. Um, what do you think, Didar? Are we in security? Are we just bad at being proactive in a way that we don't invest time in juniors or entry level people, and we keep searching for these unicorn seniors? Um, you know, which at the end of the day, we do end up spending a lot of time looking for them and paying a lot of money for them instead of maybe we could invest in the juniors. What's your take on that? Difficult question. Thank you. So I think the intention is there. We all know and we all want to get more um, junior people, even people who are changing their careers into our space because there's so many different talents, skills that we will really, really benefit from. But I think some of the realities are keeping us a little bit um, from doing it because like to be able to, as you said, to, with a junior, you need to spend a lot of time with them. You need to have your th other things sorted out so that you can give them a clear structure, clear processes, things that are working so they can start working on them. But currently, um, I talk with a lot of people. Many of us don't seem to have our house in order to be able to support that very well. We still do uh, get juniors, but not in the numbers that we want to have. No, I, I, I have to agree on you, uh, with you on that because you don't want to get someone in um, who's going to then be lost have no direction so you need someone to support them what do you rest of panelists think about that dennis so i'm now hiring a lot outside cybersecurity. so i think we we, we have a problem in in cyber security because there's not enough talent and uh, my strategy now is to create a, a way to allow individuals to do horizontal moves so allow uh, somebody who has a, a, a devil of seniority in a particular area to be able to have a job in cybersecurity uh, that is equivalent to that job, and then you provide the training. Uh, and I think that dramatically increases the talent pool. Uh, so I'm doing that at head up level, but in, in a way, for example, the way we, we're now hiring security ambassadors is finding developers, putting them in a team, and then giving them cybersecurity experience, which is already a way better way to embed the talent. So you hire a developer, you hire an SRE, you hire an IT ops, and you put that person in there. So you leverage that, and then you bump you basically put cybersecurity experience on top. And, and I think the horizontal, the more I think about it, the horizontal shift is important because if you have a certain level of expertise, let's say, you know, uh, Mario, if you wanted to jump into outside cybersecurity, you're, now you'd have to go down almost a couple of levels to go up. And the same thing that we would require somebody with, without cybersecurity experience, they will have to go, for example, for a much more junior role and then come up. And that might not be possible, you know, financially, but even like, 
you know, intellectually, like the person might say, look, I've, I've done this, I have a lot of experience, so I don't wanna go back to be, you know, somebody without a team, without this or X, Y, Z. So I think if we can create a way to move people horizontally in their careers, then the talent pool dramatically increases. So can I add on that? We are talking about lateral movements within tech. I wanna look at it from a perspective of outside skills of tech. Well, I'm that looking outside tech right. completely. Yeah. Like literally, I, I said, you know, the person can have worked even outside of engineering, right? He could be, you know, ahead of, you know, NHS instance response, right? Like, you know, for example, you know, Petra is a great example of that, right? She, when I met Petra, she was a doctor in AE, right? And so somebody can say, I know how to handle pressure, <laughs> you know, you have that. Good insulin response, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> So, but as well, like professions that we don't actually think are translated as well. I was talking to another CISO the other day about photography. What it takes to be a photographer, yeah. project planning, yeah. cost budgeting, yeah. talking to different vendors, all skills that we actually need in tech that we actually don't recruit for outside tech. So yeah. I started looking at the bigger picture of the panel or the resource pool that we can bring into tech. And I think that really yeah. makes it a lot bigger of a talent pool. Have you found that people are interested actually into moving from photography or whatever into cybersecurity? It's quite of a intimidating field, you know, whenever you talk to somebody about cybersecurity, they're like, oh, you're hacking into stuff. And you have to explain that it's like a lot more than putting a hoodie on and then just typing code or have like a matrix back background. So they need to, they need, need to want to do it, right? So this, this is not about, oh no, we pick a random person and, and do it, right? <laughs> well, what it is is there's, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of individuals that they hit on a career path, not because it was their passion, but just because they have to be good, or it just happened to be the sequence of events. The logic is to try to find those individuals. So in fact, what, one of the things that we're doing during the recruitment process is we're giving them a hacking platform because I want them to experience it. I want to actually A, see the progress, but I want them to experience actual security stuff. The right individuals they embrace it. So I don't think, in a way that you can take that off the equation. Somebody, they have to want to come to cybersecurity. They have to find it exciting. They should find it exciting. It's freaking cool. I like whatever land, whatever area you land, if, you, if it matches your, like the photography, like the planning and the stuff. In fact, what they should be saying is that you guys keep calling all these different names, but I actually, I have more cyber experience than I thought I had. You just call it different things. Right? So I, obviously coming from a different field, um, I completely agree because you don't bring into the field, you're not the same as you just came out of uni, right? You have life experience, you have work experience, you have different situational experience. So I think that those skills are very transferable. Um, so, you know, me coming from a different background, I completely support this Actually, train more, of thought. One more little comment. This also applies within cybersecurity. So for example, one of the candidates that I, I'm talking, uh, she's an amazing risk analyst, right? And, and I was talking about some of the roles that, you know, we have on one of them, we actually call head of understanding reality, which is kind of says that, right? Understands reality where you get all the testing and, and et cetera. And that person was actually is really excited about that. And again, that's a lateral move within cybersecurity. And the interesting thing is that it comes with a huge experience in risk, right? So I'm like, Ooh, that's a great, but I think it's important that that person wants to do whatever you're putting into and, and that you can't get that that journey they have to do it themselves but we get people from like uh, yeah yeah we, we do get people applying for other yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. No, i have data i can already I, I will have hopefully really good data to share in about a month and a half but i already have data that proves that that works cool we're looking forward to seeing that data so um on that thought marius what do you think is the biggest challenge? Is it the fact that the cyber market has literally exploded last, you know, this last year? Or is it the fact that there's a huge lack of skills? That's a very interesting and question. How to cope with it? It's a very interesting question because every time, every security conference, I mean, in the last two years, we talk about skill shortage. I don't believe we have a skill shortage. I think like we mentioned just now, all the skills that we use in security are very transferable and we have them across every field in life. It's just that we're very rigid in what we're looking for when we're recruiting. Five certifications in penetration testing, 
free certifications in Amazon. Do you really need the certifications? Do we really need the specific skills or can we train someone because they already have the experience of thinking? I think what we need to start recruiting is for the way of thinking of security rather than the skills. And because of we are looking for unicorn candidates that inflates the market. We are looking for someone that has all this experience uh, with three times of what the market rate is. And then the candidates apply for that role. They get rejected because they're not at that level. And then they come and apply for roles that we have expecting the same salary. But we can't pay that kind of salary. So in their mind, they're not going to apply for us because we can't offer the salary that they just got rejected for. So I think we have an overinflated market that everyone's struggling to actually hire talent because of skill shortage. But in reality, we're looking for their own skills. We're looking for certifications. We're looking for 10 years experience. We're not actually looking for the real skills that we need in these roles to succeed. Thanks for that point. Um, so when I'm hiring, I'm looking for what I can use in that person rather than what can I see that will eliminate them from that um, from the process. So, and it really helps me. So that's the exact approach. I've been building a team over the last few months, and that's the approach with the help of Petra as well. That one of the reasons she's doing this panel because she's been helping me in recruitment. We're actually looking for people, and then we actually trying to figure out how we can build the team around the skills that they have. Because if we do that, we approach all the skills that we need in a team. Rather than looking for unicorns that experience in one direction, we're trying to find who can fit within the vision that we are doing, but then how can we utilize the skills that they already have? Rather than build new skills for them, how can we utilize those skills for what we have in the team? And we complement each other. But that has as a prerequisite to already have somebody in the team with the skills, just to put it out there, you know? Is it not? No. Uh, yes. You have the skills already. No, 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 I, I agree with you. Know, you know yes, of course. Like you, you know, for this to work, you have to have people in the, in the, in the team that have experience. Right. And, and you have it so you can do that. So, you know, if you, if you are telling that, you know, can you hire somebody with no experience, dump it in the process, which to be honest, it is, sometimes that's exactly how it works. People get promoted and go, hey, you do cybersecurity now and then you do it. But I think that's harder, at least, at least for scale. You know, I think the challenge that we're talking that everybody has is that we need to find talent. We need to hire. If we can expand the talent pool, and this is for the recruiters, right? Like the recruiters should be doing this, right? They should be saying, this is an amazing individual. You can mold that person. And then they should be finding this, you know, uh, talent. And the best part is that because the market economics has pumped up the salary so high, we actually have a competitive advantage. You know, this is quite interesting. We can pay more e the equivalent other professionals because we have an inflated job market. And that's literally simple market economics. There's not enough people for the market that exists, so the prices go up. But you know, if you look outside cybersecurity, then yeah, you still have to hire a couple of the super experts. I think you do at whatever market rate it is, but you can then grow the team with the potential and you'll make them cyber experts or application security experts or et cetera in you know, three to six months. I'm going to say that when I was hiring, the team did not exist. So I did not have the other talents in the team. Um, but I still hired the people, and they became the team. They built the processes. They built uh, everything else. So from my perspective, no, it's unmuted. So from my perspective, and that's what I'm going through right now, I need out no engineer. So I need to start hiring for an engineer. And I need somebody that at least in my head and please, I'm open to any other suggestions and, uh, and ways. Somebody that has a bit of experience, so we can involve them in the role. And at the same time, then we can open a second role to a junior. But we need somebody to mentor that junior coming from the whatever background that is. Because if, if it falls on me to have to train them about everything, then I will have any time to perform other stuff that needs performance. The other way you can do that is you can outsource that part. So you, you can go to a good service provider and you say, I want somebody with these skills. And what you're doing is you're paying a premium for you having that right now, right? So, so that's the other way that you can compensate for some 
you know, less experience is you, you pat it around with really good services. The question is not to give them a blank check. The question is to be very explicit what you're actually getting. But then that becomes a really good resource for that individual. So for in that example, it says, oh, you, I want to build an AppSec team. I do think you need to have an AppSec expert in there. But it doesn't need to be FTE. It doesn't need to be part, you know, you can go out there, find one, but then treat it as part of your team. At that moment, it doesn't matter how that person gets paid and where it comes from. You just happen to find the right individual. You put it in the middle, then they can accelerate. And, and, I, and again, that's one of the things that I'm doing, right? And, and it, it works, right? It, because it, it, it gives you the best of both worlds. Well, on that note, Manos, what do you think, where could be the biggest gap? Is it DevSecOps? Is it AppSec, GRC, or finding that generalist? Pain point, mm. generalist. Hands down generalist. It's from, from what I've seen lately in the market, there are a lot of people that are like focused in CloudSec, that are focused in um, AppSec. They, they're quite happy keep working and being uh, having a, a career uh, in focus because they like people like technical stuff. If you're an engineer, you like your art, most probably. And if you've chosen AppSec, you've chosen AppSec for a reason. That doesn't mean at some point you need to drop AppSec and have to do cloud security or something like that. So people that would like to have the bigger like view and deal with everything, from my experience, are harder, much harder to find. Um, so the problem is we're very siloed when it comes to security at scale. So upsec, what did you upsec? And we don't give them the chance to progress it. It goes back to the original conversation we had about that lateral movement between different departments within security. A lot of good upset engineers want to be a generalist, but never had the exposure. So if you're looking for a generalist and you interview them, they don't know anything about what, apart from secure coding. You speak to them about AWS and say, I don't know what that is. So we need to start breaking the silos up. And I'm not saying we should have everyone as a generalist because it doesn't work. We need specialists in our fields. We need really good specialists, but we need to make sure that we are offering opportunities for people to get that experience within different teams. Do we have them secondments between different teams? Um, part of working in a large organization and big security teams, I've seen really big silos that one team doesn't know what the other team is and they all doesn't haven't got a view of the bigger picture so then you got one team that doing security operations that never involved the application security so they don't have a clue what application logs are exist so too many silos that we need to start figuring out how do we interlock those silos so we can get the talent out of it as well but we can offer the opportunity for the actual candidates and um, specialists to progress in different directions um, I come from a generalist background and I really like to be involved in everything. So every opportunity I had to work with a different team, I really liked. I was, I felt like a consultant in each security department and I really enjoyed that. And that's why actually progressing to a CISO position, that's what really helped me to have a bigger picture view of all the departments rather than application security, DevSecOps or just operations. And Dieter, do you think maybe a factor in this is the fact that people don't want to be generalists in your experience? In my, my experience, but very different because I come from more um, generalist, from second line, third line of defense to first line. So I've seen more generalists than um, specialists in my career. And I thought we were lacking more of the specialists but we, now, we need to have a chat afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all because, and um, all depends on our own experiences, I guess, um, what we have seen. Um, I, in my team, most, most of us are uh, generalists because risk and compliance, you need to understand a bit from everything and all the new technologies and everything that's going to come next year. So we're pretty generalists. We try to, each of us try to focus on one or other area that break in that silo. It's, um, yeah, it's probably enough for me to answer that question. Great, send them our way, these generalists. <laughs> and, and to, no, they're mine, they're and, mine. And to Dieter's point as well, GRC, because you mentioned the role, it was one of the roles that I could easy 
uh, fill in. I've got, I've got a really good pool of talent which people have an understanding of how we do risk, how we uh, manage things. So most probably this is where the generalist uh, comment comes in. People have understanding of um, compliance, ISO or other kind of frameworks and they come in and say, okay, I can do this or they come from an internal audit or auditor background and that helps a lot. So, yeah. yeah finding a GIC person that understands and thinks in graphs is a lot, it's a lot more difficult. You had to mention graphs here. <laughs> So, Dennis, what's your take on this coming from a pen testing background um, and then going towards higher positions, um, you know, like in in terms of being super specialized and then going general? I know that you are the type of person who, you know, dips your fingers in many pots anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but what's your thought on this? So, so I, I made a very conscious decision to, to remain very technical throughout my career. I, I, there was a lot of times when I thought I was going to management. And I, I saw some of my peers going to management and I realized a couple of years later that they didn't understand technology. And, and that, that worried me a little bit because I was like, you know, if you, there's, there's some part, at least I think there's, there's a type of role that I want to have, which I have now, which I feel you want to be very technical. Now, it's not for everybody, of course. There's, there's a lot of value in people not being technical. Like I said, I'm hiring for a lot of those and I see some amazing systems or not, but I think that I chose to be very technical for a long time. So, you know, I went deep into pen testing. I went deep into, in a way, I did the whole evolution, right? From pen testing to static analysis, to et cetera, to risk, et cetera. And so, you know, I, I feel that there's value in being a very technical person in the room. There's value in being very wise in your skill set, because when you then want to lead and then have strategies, you, you understand much more what reality is. So again, you know, having, you know, in a way, the best preparation for you to go to a very senior person, senior role is actually to, do a lot of things across the board. And, and I agree with the silos. I think a lot of teams don't have a good structure for that. And what, one of the tricks is use incidents. So I, I always use incidents, um, a lot of strategic, one of the things that sometimes the team don't, doesn't fully understand or doesn't see straight away, but I see it, is that when you put a lot of teams working together in an incident, let's say 50% of your team is working on an incident, you are breaking silos. You are getting people to understand what's going on. And you, in fact, you are, you're having people taking other people's responsibility just because you need to. And, and that's an interesting side effect. Like you take a P2 and you run it as a P1. So you know, we go deep, we, we do investigation, we fix things during an incident, we build things. So that means that, for example, you're doing a threat model in the middle of an incident. That means that you feel you're building a lock connector in the middle of an incident. So you do some development. And, and that actually breaks huge amount of silos and not just in security, right? Also within the business itself, because you know, I always feel that we're in constant recruitment, even inside the company, and you want to bring other people from other teams into the mix. So yeah, use incidents as a great way to do that. So I think every new employee has to be involved in an incident. It's the quickest way to learn anything about the business, yeah. processes of the business, uh, the actual tech stack of the business, get involved in an incident, especially a P1 incident, and you will learn, it's invaluable. Exactly, yeah. And that silos, yeah, you completely, you really understand and build actually relationships because the during an incident, everyone's trying to fix yeah. the issue as quick as possible. So you're contributing and those uh, silos get broken and then you can easily communicate with those teams later. And if you don't have P1s, take a P2, escalate it. If you don't have P2s, create P2s. Because guess what? We, we do testing, right? So we can create incidents, right? It's one of the few things that we are probably the only team in the business that can do that in a legit way. We can actually create secure incidents and then say, why didn't we detect it? Well, how, how was that possible? And then you, you run that to learn all those things. And I agree, the best way to onboard the talent is throw in the middle of the incident, you know, very efficient. I, I just want to take it a notch back to your um, comment about remaining technical in management. Now, I could say there's one caveat to it. Um, I'm not saying you shouldn't be technical in management. But I'm just saying there's one caveat, and I'm just interested to hear what's your uh, solution to it. Is sometimes when you're too deep into technicalities, too deep into looking at code, um, you can lose oversight of the whole picture. And what's your advice to anyone who wants to stay technical but still make sure to keep an eye on the whole picture, not to lose sight of the forest from one tree. 
Can I, can, can I jump, yeah, ask yeah. a quick yeah. thing, yeah. make quick clarification. When we say technical, do we mean hands-on? Yeah. And that these are the two things, yes? It's a good point. Because technical could be technical, no, 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 but not hands-on. Hands hands cool. So, so the, the trick is to jump layers, right? So the first one is being accountable. If you are the one accountable, it's very easy to be focused because you are being made accountable by your boss, right? So in a way, like if you lose, if you're losing your audience, it's going to be very obvious at that level. So I don't think that's the, the challenge. The interesting thing is that when you want to go deep, you have to skip a couple layers. And this is interesting. So that means that you need to be, for example, an operator or a technical resource for a team that almost they is almost like your boss or you reporting to somebody that actually reports to you in another level. So my, my, my point is that when you go technical, you jump a level. So the good news when you're senior, you control your time. So I, I get to choose some of the projects I'm involved in. So I strategically choose projects where I still do coding. I strategically choose projects where I'm deeply involved in an incident. And it's always sometimes I think weird for the team when I say, look, I'm not here now as a CISO, I'm here as somebody who can write a log connector in five minutes, or I can investigate this very fast. So in this incident, I'm reporting to you, you know, and I think that's the key. So <clears throat> that's very key, right? Because you're not operating in a CISO capacity in that specific no. incident, you're basically acting as an, ex an additional resource to that project yeah. because you've got the technical expertise. But it's, for me, it's very important that we clarify as you become more management it depends on the expectation of who you report to as well right do they expect you to give them a report on the high level or do they expect you to give them code analysis and things like that so in different industries different levels of companies that i can say is on a big scale because you can be a seasoned small company that you are the person that's doing the hands-on work as well but in large organizations the expectation could be that the CISO is a PR role. You're not actually the technical person. So different organizations, but different level of role. I have a question for all the panelists. Now, we all know that changing jobs is one of the easiest ways to get a pay rise. We all have done it, we've all been there. What do you think? First of all, do many companies do enough and care enough about retention, because we should. And the other question is, what should we do to keep our employees? I want an answer from every one of you. Negotiate a good starting salary. <laughs> yeah, but how do you keep them? What is the expectation when you hire someone? How long do you want to retain that talent? For me, when I recruit someone, I. One of the questions I set myself during the recruitment period is how, do I, how can I progress that person within the team? Can I offer them progression? If I can't offer them progression either financially or technically, I need to be upfront with them to say, look, this is the position that I can't offer you anything more than one or two years to keep you at the level that you are. So I bring talent in that can progress and count, in fact, the pay salary and actually technical expertise increase. But it's very hard as well, though, to, there's the exceptions so that you have people that are progressing really fast within the industry. And how do you retain that talent? It's an important question because it's hard to justify sometimes to the people team, HR, why are you doing that? I think as CISOs, as hiring managers, we always have to put a business case. What does it look like retaining that talent versus losing that talent? And I think in the past, security and tech, we're not very good at doing that. So we always lost talent, and then it actually cost us a lot more to bring in new talent that's not up to scratch. Just because we used to say, yeah, 3% increase is the company-wide thing. We're not very good with finance when it comes to technical. I would now, if I had to do that, I will put a financial plan to present. This is what X amount of it's going to cost us to retain this talent because we are matching the expectation. And this is what it's going to cost us to actually replace them. This is the time and effort. This is the security impact that we're going to have because it's a security resource that we, we need to recruit and show them that impact. You might not win the fight the first time. You might not win the fight the second time. 
uh, we're going to have to start changing the mentality. What does it look to retain talent? Sometimes it's the, the salary. Sometimes it's the actual technical progression. You need to be able to offer a technical progression. I've never joined a company that I wanted to say after I reached the technical ceiling. And I, come, I have 11 years experience in the technical world. I've had seven different jobs. When you're saying technical ceiling, means that technology keeps evolving all the time. Yes, we do have new solutions. We have, uh, now we have containers. Next year, we might have, I don't know, something else, quantum containers or something. Um, and you might need to secure this. You know, there's always going to be, you, you're saying that when the stuff you're learning is less than the BAU, then it becomes boring. I use the word boring. I don't remember whether you said it or not. From a previous conversation we had. <laughs> so um, the ceiling can be two things. One is not challenging enough for me, which means I'm not learning anything new. Um, I'm not a BAU person. So for me, once the, the learning curve flattens and everything becomes BAU, I start losing interest and I get bored. As a right manager, you need to see that, spot it, and then give me new challenges. Because my time is more valuable to you if I'm challenged, if I'm working on things that I find interesting. If I'm doing BAU, I'm not the best suited person. There are the individuals that are suited in doing BAU. But if my role is not learn a learning curve, then I get bored, I get less motivated, and then it becomes harder for you to keep me there. And that's the the thing is, well, salary increase doesn't help me there. Yeah. It needs to be the technical increase. I need to be there to learn something new. Um, so that's the two things that we know very good are addressing at the moment. Because one of the other things is when we are, when you join a company as a security engineer, no one imagines that you can be senior in a year. And I say, why not? If, if you are actually performing at the senior level, why shouldn't we make you senior and give you more responsibility to do? If, if, if that's what you're capable of, and that's what it means for me retaining you, why shouldn't we do that? And on that note, like managers might get afraid or we make them senior too quickly and then they might leave too quickly to buy, find another job, another senior role somewhere else. And it's like, this is how people think sometimes. And that's not a problem. Yeah, exactly. But it's, it's a, a mentality that exists, mm -hmm. you know? But it's a benefit. I want everyone in my team that outperforms their role to leave because it's more beneficial for my team if I have people that can progress and learn and be motivated. If they reach the ceiling and the board, why would I keep them? If you can't offer them a good op other opportunity. Yeah, if I, can't, I couldn't, if I couldn't offer them another opportunity to increase the, the challenge for them, to, the learning curve and progression within their career, why should, I wouldn't want to keep them. I would want them to... I would help them write their CV mm -hmm. so they can find that better role that someone else can offer them. Okay. I want to add to the original question, pretty much plus one to what Maya said, but in management, we really need to spend more time in strategizing and making friends with the board, because otherwise, if the board doesn't see the value of us, there's no point in us even trying to fight for the um, pay rises for our current employees or getting more um, support from to hire more. We need to be really become a little bit more, I don't want to say political, but see the bigger picture. It's not just about security people. Most of the time don't even know what security does or what the value it brings. It's really on us to make them understand that we bring value. So, so that problem occurs also outside security, right? So in fact, I, I heard a recent story on data science, exactly the same thing. Um, the, the, the thing about here, so going back to the original point, like if, if, if somebody's on your team just because of the financial package, then that's, you know, there's, there's always better, you know, that's not the reason why they should be there. Now, as, you know, as it has happened to me several times and, and, uh, and I'm sure to you guys too, is that when somebody leaves the team to find another great job. You know, it's, it's you, know, it, you know, there's that moment where you go, well, we lost capability, but I'm always very proud because for me, it means that you took somebody 
you got them to another level and now they you know they went and find other things and you never know you know sometimes it does happen you work with that person again um but i i think the the element that we need to compensate for the salary is the opportunity that the person has in work and whether it's training where where things that they can do where where career progression and one one thing that and i think did a is for on is I think we need to be better at doing what Netflix does, which is to do a very quick adjustments to market reality. So the problem is that if yearly cycles for peer reviews are not fast enough, we need to be better at saying, look, this person was uh, a normal engineer and now is a senior engineer. And actually, to be honest, if you have a great team and if you have a great environment, that's exactly what will happen. Because from a, from a market point of view, you take somebody who was doing this, and then when they go to market, you know, I remember some of the, the people that worked in, in my teams, they would go to an interview and they almost ask, why do you want to leave? Right? Like, you know, everything you described, that it's awesome. You're already doing it. Like, what, what, what's the situation, right? And, and that's what you want to have. You want to have an environment where people can grow a lot. They can, they can hit the thing. What I found, the ceiling I found is not that engineering is business. The, the, the moments I felt I slowed down or, the, or my team slowed down is when we hit the business. And that would always happen because there's a lot of things you can do in the cybersecurity world, which we own our destiny. But there's always a moment where you hit the business. And, and the only way to secure, to continue our security transformation is to change the business. And that gets political. It's not even political. It's the, it's the business model of the company now aligned with where you want to go. And then it might be a situation where you can now not give your team the type of growth and experience that they almost deserve because you cannot create that space for them. We need to become better at business. Oh yeah, well. absolutely. I think that one of the skills that we never see as security skill, it's to actually understand finance and actually understand business. Yeah. And as you progress in the management track of the security, that's the two actual most important arguments because your team relies on you being able to negotiate the budget and negotiate the actual business acumen. Where do we sit within the business? So if you can't have those two skills, then a lot of the senior management struggles because you can't convince them. Yeah. But you, you can hack that too, right? Like, you know, I, I sometimes think that I'm still hacking. I'm just working with different primitives, right? Like you look at the business, your job is to understand how do they operate? What do they want to do? How do they think? And then you rewrite your message into how they think. Right. And I know that I go into the very technical and I go into very, you know, sometimes, you know, deep in the woods. But when I present to management, some of the best compliments I've heard was senior management saying, wow, I never understood how security could have been so strategic because I position security in a way that allows them to understand the value that we provide is not just to prevent a hack or not to do this. There's a lot of other values we do. But yeah, you need to, to be a, a player there. But that, that's just reverse. It's the same thing. You reverse engineer and you know, how they think, you really need the direction that they're going. And by the way, if you don't like the direction, you should leave, right? You know, like life is too short to be working for a company that you don't believe the direction is. And there's moments where you have to have a line to say, if the business chooses that, then that's me out of here, right? Because, you know, I don't believe, we, I don't have the same value system as a particular, and these individuals, like a lot of this is individuals, like you need to align yourself with the CEO, with the board, with the execs there, and understand where is their center of gravity. And that ultimately is what allows you to create the space that allows you to have the talent that you want. And, um, and if you do that, I think you do create good talent and, uh, and you can nurture them and then empower them and then you know, they, they get better. I think from what I'm hearing um, to keep the employees, it's, super important to make sure to show the value of security to the business and like Didar said to present it to the board um also be realistic in how much we can keep the employees because like marius mentioned there is a ceiling and we need to be aware of it and we need to understand how much are we happy for this person to stay and then accept when they want to leave but then also adjust our pay to the market um and then make sure that the employees are in other ways so if you don't know the netflix uh, rule what they do is they encourage the employees to go to market they encourage the employees to talk to other people and they basically say you give us good benchmarking data right literally you know read the book no rules rules and that's how they operate and i think that's fair right and in a way is that if, if the market grows then you should be paid accordingly 
sometimes the challenge going back to the business is that there isn't good data and then it becomes a, a weird thing but if you can show good data why this person or this role now has changed and now is worth more and to your point is going to cost us more to replace that person then the growth uh you're there and finally if you're working for a company that says three percent that's it and that's all we can do sometimes you need to go well maybe the company is going through a, a tough time maybe that's reality maybe you can't do anything about it or if it's just pure policy because somebody says and computer says no then again like do you really want to work there right yeah and from from Marius's previous point as well into your one um, right now is like depends on on the industry as well so if somebody goes in um, and have a, an interview or they, or they get an offer from uh, a fintech company sometimes the salaries in fintech is like much higher than the ones that we can cover so it's a bit of baselining with the, to the different um, uh, to the different company types as well yes so i cannot match the money sometimes that a fintech might give to certain expertise um, so. but, but even not just them right? like now you know the big players are paying a lot of money but i i do think that above a certain point you you want to tell the candidates or, or the employees look you, you if you're making a your career purely for financials that's a tough one now there is baselines and of course people need to dis make decisions based on their circumstances but you know yeah there's a lot of attraction for cyber security but do you want to work for a massive company where you you know your, your growth is limited and you're a little piece of a massive car or a car in a massive thing or you want to actually have a huge amount of potential where you're growing and then you you have that growth so that's how we have to compete and the offering that you have let's take a fintech might be a high stressful environment they have to work nine to six you have to be in the office so we have other things in different industries to offer to compensate that but if someone ultimately wants the higher salary you can always find a higher salary anywhere you go you can go contracting you can if it's money you're the main driver for you then i can't keep you <laughs> then go work in dubai right <laughs> so it'd just be funny but like you know you know if we have like you know go and work for dubai you start free right they pay a lot of money you live in a gated community and if that's what you want to do it's great right if you really want to make a lot of money go there they pay a lot of money it's good stuff it's cool projects but you know in the middle of nowhere and you know that might be for a part of your life that'll be exactly what you want so there you go like make, make your choices right you know if your if your point is maximizing your financial return then there's certain industries that you can go to right sorry that Nothing to do with Dubai, nothing against Dubai, it's just good. Personal preference. One question I still want to throw in there. Um, now, when we look for talent, should we be more proactive in going to universities and boot camps? Well, yeah, look, I, I think you want to go everywhere, but I, I think I really like the idea of of creating all these pathways and these challenges for, for talent to enter the organization. I think universities are a great place to do that. But if it, it's, it's the same thing. Like once you say, I'm willing to take talent outside cybersecurity, then it's, it's almost like it goes from the 16 year old, which is probably when you can legally hire them, all the way to the 70, 80 year old person. What matters is they have that passion. They want to do that jump. I agree there. So I'm a very generalist person. And uh, when we target this, we need to say, okay, we're going to target talent outside, right? Doesn't matter if it's university colleges. I'm a person that never went, that went to university, but I never finished because uh, I found that I was dyslexic, colorblind, I had to drop out. So you wouldn't have found me as a talent coming out of university. So why restrict just to universities? I don't believe restriction into one other year or schools or colleges. I think we need to widen the net as much as we can. The wider the net, the more resource we have, the more we change people's lives and bring them into one of the most interesting fields I think exists. There's not another field that we touch everything in a business. We, we know every single thing that goes in the business, any business, any industry. So I think we need to widen the net and not just focus. A lot of the focus I went into universities to get university students. I believe we don't need degrees uh, to go into these fields. So we need to make sure that, yeah, we are looking at universities, but we are looking at technical schools, school dropouts. Um, some of the reason that the school dropouts is because they were 
too bored to be with school, conform to the school methodology? Why should we not look at those? What about black cat hackers? <laughs> it's, a setup, it's a setup question. So, so I think we need to define black hat here, right? Because you know I, I'm old enough to remember when people would get arrested at DefCon, right? And uh, you know where you know where you know, the, the the definition of I, I think the, the, the question is criminals, right? Do you hire a criminal? And I, I and I guess the question is, do you hire a reformed criminal? I think that's a different thing. And and the reality is that. Our, our model should be that, you know, if somebody does a crime, they should pay for the crime. Once they pay for the crime, you know, that's it. That's their, basically, their, their payment for the cost that they created done, right? So I don't have a problem with that. I think I do have a problem with people that cross that line on, on the sort of the, the malicious or the criminal entity, because, you know, that means they are a criminal, you know, whether they're being caught or not, right? Um, and I, I remember when I used to do a lot of training, and my training style went from you know, 700 slides to let's just ad lib and let's hack the organization during the training. And usually by the second day, I always get the question, why don't you go to the black side, right? Like, come on, you just show us how to freaking hack half organization. And I just say, look, you know, if, if you're a criminal, you're a criminal, right? If you, if you have a mindset that you're okay to exploit people to do things in a criminal way, then that's your mindset. You know, if you're a good person, you want to do good for your life and for your family, and if you want to look your kids in the mirror and, you know, and then be proud of you, then it's not because you can, but you do, right? It's, it's that simple. So I think, you know, I, I remember this, this moment when I used to go, to, you know, when we used to do the DEFCON in Black Hat. I remember thinking that you could literally go to Black Hat, right, and grab a random people, a group of 10, 20 people, sit them on a table and ask them the question, if you went rogue, if you went malicious, could you cause a lot of damage? And the thing that was shocking is not that people would say yes, it's just people say, yeah, 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 I would do that. So and that shows you that there's a lot of people that can go to that dark side. But I, I think, you know, I don't want to work with people who done that jump because I think that shows you a lot more about you that you are fundamentally a criminal. You have your, your ethics are out of kilt to, you know, I would say the way I operate. So, um, <laughs> I had time to think of this question over the last few weeks. I would agree with you um, to the certain point of what makes them a criminal. It's not the conviction. Why did they do it in the first place? Was it a teenager that basically got bored and because it was the school didn't know how to build those ethics into him? them they go um they've done the time they come out reform yeah reform and that's the key yeah. element there what does reform mean yeah. for me i would i would hire someone like that that did it in his teenagers that did, didn't understand what they were doing ethics wasn't really embedding into them they did the time they came out reform do i want to offer them a second opportunity yes from hiring in perspective is it a risk for me is a massive risk for me, but then it's a massive risk to the business. Because what does ref reform mean? Does it mean that he hasn't done it yet or is not going to do it because he understands that what he did was wrong? Mm -hmm. So for me, it's actually getting that line. Where, the, where does that line stand? And I will give him the second chance as long as I understand they are working on the right path. They understand what they did was on the wrong path. They actually have mentorship now to demonstrate that they're actually on the right path and they want to use those skills for good. What, what don't, I wouldn't give a chance to someone if someone did it for financial game or they understood what they were doing and they were actually going on the extreme criminal, like organized crime, and then they say they reform. Yeah, and, and that's what I mean by making a choice, right? Like I, I, I think we, we, are, we have a twisted society where sometimes we treat people who are desperate as criminals, which is wrong, right? You know, if people are at a level of de desperation, I think the, the system is broken, right? So, and again, you know, there's, there's definitely a whole generation that the only difference between the people who got caught and who didn't get caught is that the other ones got caught. But I think there's an ethical line, right? I think there's an ethical line where you can choose. You can choose to destroy, you can choose to exploit, you can choose to take advantage. And that, that I have a problem with. I, have a, I, don't, 
I think there's a very different line from the people who exploit because they don't, don't have a choice. And I think that's not what we're talking about. Yeah, I, I agree with you. There's a lot of the black hat, the way you would describe it, is the ones who have a choice, who, who basically go to the criminal organizations, who go to that world. And by the way, like a lot of the attackers that we see today, they, it, these are individuals, they do their day job, right? Like it's, it's just a business, right? So again, you know, some of them might be doing criminal activities, but actually it's just the business and it's the, a good paying job that exists where they live. So yeah, those lines are a bit fuzzy. Yeah, I think that's quite important to clarify because um, someone like Mario said can be a teenager, have, uh, you know, um, problems with their parents, not have a good upbringing, isolated, um, not understood, but their environments may be neurodiverse. Um, you know, they get into something and, you know, they get on the wrong track. And then there is the ones that Dennis mentioned that are within criminal organizations, they have a malicious intent and they're doing it with a conscious decision. Since we're on the political and correct stuff, right? So, so the other joke I used to say, is that when you know the follow-up would be okay so i don't go to the dark side because i'll be a criminal and i just said well if i really want to exploit people if i really wanted to uh make as much money as i could and then i hope i'm not telling anybody in the room i says i'll go and work in the city right because that's what a lot of the trading that's what a lot of the financial people are doing they just do it legally right so again if i wanted to be a programmer that wanted to make the most amount of money i would set up a freaking hedge fund and I would basically game the market, knowing you know that my actions had a lot of repercussions. But in a way, you know, it's kind of like it's, it's quite interesting, right? I do feel that there's a level of intelligence, a level of logic that sometimes the um, the, the technology and, and security gives. And there's a moment where you almost have to say, well, if I do want to be a criminal, why don't I do it legally? Because there's a lot of ways you can do the same thing legally, right? And then you know it's legal, right? And you get away with it. But I've met those individuals and it's horrible because their sense of ethics, their sense of logic, their sense of morality was gone a long time ago. And you go, yeah, you might have a couple more years on your bank account than me, but I would never trade my life for yours. So they are worse black hat guys than some of the other ones because they know what they're doing and they're making a huge return and they have a massive impact in society because they're hacking society. So I like the fact that I can go home and I'm making the world better. I'm making the world healthier these days too, which is great. And, um, you know, it's about finding talent, right? And, and reforming. And I, I really like the idea of, of finding, you know, um, basically individuals who have gone through the, the bad system. And, and like, there's a lot of great people from the military now that are joining our operations. And I, and I think if the key is to create a, a program that allows them to grow. And I do think we can do better at the industry of, of doing that. Disclaimer, our views represent, our personal views represent us and our corporations that we work exactly. on. <laughs> None of us here. Um, Didar, um, from your point of view, as you have loads of experience in risk, what's your thoughts on this topic of hiring someone who's potentially reformed I could only talk theoretically. I really don't know what I would do if, when I'm in that situation because I think it would all depend on the person, their um, intents, their motives. I don't have a rule in my mind uh, yet. Um, okay. Well, thank you, everyone. What I want to do now is put One. any comments, questions to the audience. One more point. Ah. Uh, we mentioned about talking to schools and uh, unions, and et cetera. Let's not forget STEM ambassadors and something like that. that would be, let everybody could do it. Everybody could go and help and provide some insight and let people guide, uh, guide people into cybersecurity and understand what they're going to be doing on the roads. Yeah, let's go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. I actually did, actually, I did that for a while. Uh, there was a time where, uh, again, as, as a way to get my team to be more out there, I actually signed me and, and them to, um, to go to schools. And we actually gave lessons to, um, I think it was 16, 17 year olds. And we basically took some of the um, them developer applications and we basically tell them to hack. It was really cool. They were like, wow, this is freaking awesome. 
how much do you earn? I'm like, yeah, I feel like this. Is <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but, but the point is that, you know, I think we, we do need to inspire that next generation, right? And what we do is really cool. Like, we have a fucking great job. Like, if you explain to them and says, we get paid to do this, they're like, wow, you know, that's, that's really good. So I do think that we need, you know, to do more to, to go to the industry, to, to go out there, talk to them, you know, and, you know, we have great jobs and we're professionals and it's, it's a great career path, right? And, and it's, it's a, a really cool thing that we, we need to do more. Cool, thank you. So anyone in the audience has any comments, questions? I'm gonna hand the mic. No one? There we go. Anything for the panelists or comments? Um, my observation stroke question will be, I mean, I look at this event now and um, we'll talk about inclusion, diversity and all that. Um, what is the effort that you guys will be making to um, attract minorities, you know, ethnic minorities into cybersecurity? Because there's a pool of talents, I think, uh, that are available within those space, but um, as you see in this program, I think it's only two, three, four of us, you know, or less. Is it because of the publicity or there's just no awareness? Good question. Great question. I think individually we are all part of different communities and we try to engage those communities into uh, whatever we do. We publicize what we're doing. We encourage them to get more active in the communities as well. We build them up. We, they built me up. My communities built me up. So I do try to do that in return. Uh, but was that question for this event more or for, for the whole industry? For yes, so we are all, um, Please also, guys also should answer this. <laughs> but yeah, we do get um, a lot of, we don't get enough applications from women, but we are getting a lot of more applications than a few years before. So I think the efforts are starting to pay off, but we need to keep doing it. We don't, uh, we should not become complacent. We have a fundamental problem, and, and I have to say, I, I can actually, you know, say this with with a straight face, right? Like, I'm going way out of my way, not because I, you know, that's the thing, is because it's the right thing to do to hire, you know, multi talent, multi, you know, you know, diverse individuals and teams, right? I feel that, and and I, by the way, I, I will go for any idea. If you have any idea of what we're doing can be done better, just talk to me, right? Because we rewrote the job specs to remove the jargon things. We remove all the kind of crazy dependencies that we talked about. I removed the, the requirement to do a CV. So I said, well, you send a CV, but I said, send me a presentation. It's a much better way of doing it. We basically looking for people outside cybersecurity. So I'm like, tell me what more should I do, right? But when I look at the stats, it's still completely disproportionate. You know, they're, they're, you know, it's almost like the talent pool is not there and I'm trying to reach out, right? I'm trying to hire as much diversity as I can because actually it's the right thing to do. Right, you know, the more diverse your team is, there's science and there's data, and I have experienced it, that the more diverse your team is, the better they will be to behave, right? And, but we do have a problem in the industry. There's just not enough of them, which is why I hope that as we widen the talent pool to outside of cybersecurity, we, we reach some of those pockets. But hey, you know, give me ideas, right? I, I, I go for them. Like, I, I feel that every idea that I've heard that makes sense, we're trying it. And, and if we don't, if we haven't got it right, let us know and we iterate. But I feel that, you know, it's not for lack of trying that sometimes we, we don't hire them. There's definitely a, a, a lack of talent in, not talent, of amount of, of talent that exists, right? And there's also interesting because now you, you, you start to have a bit of a premium for diversity, right? Now, sometimes it's done for the wrong reasons, but there's definitely a premium that starts to occur where, you know, you, you can get hired sometimes you know, if, if you come from one of those, you know, backgrounds, which is, which is also the wrong thing to do, right? Because everybody should be, you know, you should not be discriminating either way. But yeah, but like, you know, let me know if you have ideas. And, and I think we should codify some of the ideas in standards that then others can follow. And I'm trying to learn from others. But there's definitely a, a, 
a, a funnel problem where there's just not enough talent applying. I don't know. That's, that's what we've, also, we've also started looking outside of the UK to, uh, to hire in different uh, countries as well, and that increases yeah, the, yeah. The, the diversity. So um, again, it comes down to the talent that we're looking for. But as I said, bigger pool, bigger diversity, and more, um, more opportunities for people to apply different gender. It's, it's a big problem in the industry. We try a lot of different things, so, so we're always open for ideas. Um, I think one of the reasons we do an open security summit is to attract a lot of different uh, people to join us inside and outside security to try to build and diversify our, our talent pool. So just, just to give you an example of what it is for, a recruit, um, for us recruiting from as a management perspective, I had for a senior security engineer 200 applications. There was one uh, female role, uh, one female application. So, so for, from that perspective, we need to actively look if we were going to look from those 100 CVs. So there's a reason why there's no applications and that's the, what we need to address. Why there's not so many applications in those minority sites? Because I think, I don't think there's not enough talent out there. I think they're just not applying for it. They, they, for some reason, they're excluding themselves from that process because 200 CVs and one minority profile doesn't actually represent the actual talent pool out there. It also comes back to the point with the STEM ambassadors and talking to unis and uh, talking to the different uh, groups that we are all part of to start plugging the, the career path early in the communities so people can start evolving in the communities. But not just unis. Not just unis, yes, sir. But, but also, I, look, I think the talent also needs to be sometimes, okay, can I be a little bit incorrect? And I'm going to use DIDA as a great example, right? Uh, the talent needs to be proactive, right? So if you look at DIDA, right? In the middle of the pandemic, she made a choice to be insanely active in the summit, right? So she went from being this shy individual that I try to nudge and push to somebody who'd go out there, organize things, do some do events by herself, contact individuals that six months before you would freak out even, you know, knowing and you you grow spectacularly, right? But it was on her. Like I felt that yes, the open security summit gave you a platform. So, you know, there's also a thing where we need to start to make also some of the communities is kind of like, you know, yes, there's great opportunities, but they also need to be proactive. And, and I, my hypothesis is that if we can make better the jump between careers, the lateral move that I was talking about, we will find a lot more talent that can then get into the business. And we need to find a better way to tell people that, it's not because you have imposter syndrome that you should actually not apply to it because imposter syndrome is a real thing, you know. But you know, that is a great example of success. Thank you. Um, jumping on the imposter syndrome comment, I think maybe I'm wrong, but from my experience, I can say that a lot of women have imposter syndrome in a way that when there's a huge job spec and like a list of technical skills that are wanted. Um, women are the ones who are going to be maybe because they're brought up that way to be more self-critical and say, well, I don't fit in this role. I'm not going to even try when men are just going to say, well, you know, uh, maybe I don't fit all of the skills, but I'm sure I can manage. So there is, I think, a lot to do in going back to the culture and trying to empower, I'm just talking from women's perspective, trying to empower women more to speak up and and to build that confidence um, like right from early ages. So you just mentioned job spec. So we, my philosophy of a job spec is as simply as possible. How would you deal with though the, the vast majority of CVs that you get because now it's too simple? So I, my, my job spec, I don't know if anyone's seen them, they're very, very simplistic. I'm looking for way of thinking rather than skills. Uh, the downside of that is that the number of CVs that I get that have nothing to do with the actual role, it's amazing. Yeah, it's simple, man. You just ask them to do a presentation. And, and you give them two choices. It can be a presentation about something they're passionate about or a presentation instead of their CV. And you get rid of 90% of the applicants. 
right? And and the point the point here is that if you cannot string together a presentation, even if it's just images, even if it's just freaking screenshots about something that you care about, about something that you're passionate about, you already found the you know, uh, you know that that's not the right individual, and. And that's a great way to, to do that because then they have to think about what they want to do in the job. They have to think about how they want to present. So I'm telling you, I have data to support you. Like I, I have a huge amount of quality. Like the, the candidates who do present the CV, they tend to be very good, right? The, so the, the, the presentation. And that's the way you do it. You, you lower the bar of entry. You, you get rid of all the shopping list of stuff. You make it something which is generic, which yes, it could be gained. I have this conversation with my HR people. They say, well, then, Anybody can apply. I'm like, well, not, not really, right? You have to have that. And then I'll add to it that they have to have the passion for the role. They have to have the, the desire to do that. And again, you ask them to present about it, the right individual has no problem doing that. You know, Petra is still one of my first child examples, right? Of when she sent the presentation, you know, I, I knew we were gonna hire her. I just wanna make sure she was, a, she was alive and she existed and it was actually, it made sense, right? And you had but, a worldly map. Yeah, and, and she had world <laughs> map, right? You know, it was very funny. I, I have to say, I was reading that. And by the time she got the world map, oh, that's it. I like, you know, you know my it's, decision. It's on LinkedIn still, right? It's still on LinkedIn, right? Yeah. yeah. But but I, I think that's the thing, right? Like, I think that the job specs, and again, you know, give me feedback, right? So, I, you know, I've, I've been publishing some job specs recently. And, you know, I'm trying exactly to, in the job specs, we, we talk about the role, and then we talk about the, the, the attributes we want. And then, so the trick was, again, happy to get feedback on this instead of talking about you need this we talked about this is what you're going to be responsible for which is a little bit different because you can look and say well i'll never be responsible for that but again you know think about let's say you you write for instance response you put a scene in there okay if you've never heard of a scene but you are expected to have intellectual curiosity of going and knowing that's what it is and they're going oh it's just an event correlation thing and answering this and that and that and doing events okay cool i can learn that so, so again, if you turn it around and say, this is what, we, what you're going to be responsible for, I think that's a softer way to put that message through. But, and again, I would argue then go and work for companies who provide those kind of CVs, you know, or provide sorry, those kind of job specs, right? Because they're much more aligned. <laughs> I want to add to Petra's point. We now have to start to have more women role models in the industry. So I think that's going to help with the um, generations that are coming up with all the all the STEM uh, girls um, communities and activities as well, because we didn't, I didn't have that when I was jumping into this. Now it gives me more confidence to see more uh, female CISOs. If you want data, uh, Jane Franklin's insecurity book is really good. It has some really good data. And and what Pat was saying is true. Like women, and I've seen that with my daughters, right? Like just to be clear, right? Women do tend to be less, I would say, cavalier than 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 sometimes yeah, the men. We're, we're right? really like, perfectionists. We should stop doing. Which, which, to be honest, it was actually. But this is my problem with CVs, right? Because the the real the real talent sometimes downplay their talent, and the the one that sometimes is not that good overplays the whole thing. But then, you know, how the hell do you, you you tell the difference, right? So at that moment, that's what I'm saying. I'm calling the shots. And and by the way, on the presentation, I say, show me your values. Show me who you care. Show me what what makes you you. So again, on Petra, she talks about she's a volleyball player. And she said, playing volleyball, quasi-professional, gives me this, 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 this. And just that analysis showed her analysis, her capacity for analytic thinking, her teamwork, all that kind of stuff. And that's because she plays volleyball, right? And again, what's the hobbies of an individual? That sometimes tells you more about their value system than everything else that they do. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm going to leave the option for anyone else to make any comments or questions. Hello, Roberto from the Sex University, Hendon. Uh, I would like to talk about, we were talking already about employability. But I would like to talk about like unexperienced, unexperienced uh, people or for example, people that are currently studying, they want to approach the world cybersecurity and the, the world industry start the employment. Uh, it's quite difficult to actually to get an actual inter initial interview since if you don't have experience, you even don't get the chance to get an interview. So do you think that uh, the current employment system that nowadays we have, forces people to lie on their CV in order to get an interview? 
It doesn't. Um, you should, you should. Well, the system does. Maybe the system, but it's still up to the person. You, you shouldn't just apply for the roles. You should come to meetups like this and talk with the people, build your network. That's usually that what gets you the job, not, not just applying to 120 roles. Yeah, Sorry. I mean, uh, not everyone uh, does have the possibility like to uh, attend meeting maybe before or uh, financial uh, financial needs, or maybe they don't have enough time, they have other things to do, or illness. I mean, it's not, I mean, I'm just uh, talking about everyone that to, doesn't have experience, maybe want to try to uh, apply for entry level job, but they still pretend like people with experience, which is like kind of, uh, you know, it's a paradox. So this is why we have events like this. And the benefit is we're streaming it online so everyone can access it for free and participate for free. The submissions as well, you can submit a talk and that's why I recommend to anyone junior that wants to break in security and actually is failing because of the interviews. Start presenting at these events, even if something simple, you build your community, you build connections, and it makes it easier for when you go for your next role. This is the talk on your CV, you put your talk. The, the security person that will look at your CV will be intrigued, trust me. I've seen CVs which links that on talks and I'm always intrigued to find out what they've been talking about. That gives you the opportunity to present yourself without even getting an interview. So present in these events, build your community, because I tell you something that I've realized in my last few years, and the more I became senior, connections do matter in security. Sometimes you have a need for an engineer and someone will recommend you someone. So you're not even opening the role. So 90% of the jobs, that get recruited, there's not even a job opening because someone basically said, I've got a really good engineer, do you want to hire him? And as you could become more senior, that becomes a lot more the case. So go to events like this, present, even the basic, uh, there's someone that is always willing to learn, there's always someone more junior than you that has less experience that would like to hear you, and start building that community and network. That will help you with your CV because instead of lying on your CV, you actually give you the presentations that you made. So you actually give some evidence of what you know. And never, never lie on your CV, right? But, but look, you have to hack you into the job. Like, look, it's quite funny. I was actually thinking, you, I'm sure this is still online. When I go into security, there was a moment where uh, I found OWASP. So I was doing a bunch of stuff in .NET, and I found Mark Curfee talking about OWASP. And he was like, hey, anybody interested in .NET? And I just joined that community. And I used my energy to be a player in that community. And I start to presentations, I started to be involved. And yeah, there's a, probably a lot of gigs that I got because I had that. So I think open source is really a great asset. Like look at Open Security Summit, look at OWASP. How many projects in OWASP are amazing? And they're like two, three, four individuals. So you could almost like throw a dart and, and, and OWASP projects or Open Security Summit projects. We have some amazing stuff that still could be done that it's there for the taking, right? So, you know, if you can find that, you could start to build relationships. And the best way to get a job is to actually talk to somebody and show, look, I've done this, this, this. And that already shows that you've been proactive, shows that you can deliver stuff. So it almost shows a huge amount of values. So look, another thing is bug bounties, right? Like there's, these days you even get paid for it, right? I'm from generation that we, we, we were threatened to be arrested, right? Which is different. So, um, you know, now you, you know, go to the bug bounty system and, and hack away, right? And then that gives you credibility. So, you know, I think there's lots of communities that you can be involved in. And the, the difference is that if you're waiting for permission, that's almost the hardest challenge, right? But if you're waiting for permission to be involved, that tells me that if I hire you, you're still gonna be waiting for permission, right? So uh, another great example is Upwork, right? Or other freelance community websites that you can go in there, create an account, play market economics, like lower your price, right? You know, if you go there and you, you say, I'm at this price and I can do some tests, you're gonna get some jobs, build your reputation. And then, you know, that gives you the connection, that gives you the experience. More importantly, that gives you the ability to have delivered stuff, which to be honest, when you're hiring somebody junior, that's exactly what you wanna see. And by the way, when, when I reviewed Petra's, if I had reviewed Petra's CV, I would have not hired her. Let's just be very clear. Right? She was not hired because of her CV, because she didn't have experience in cybersecurity. 
I, sh I think you were finishing your master's by then, right? Or something like that. So if we went purely by the CV, by the experience, we never hired her. So we hired her because in this case, we looked for a presentation and we saw her and what she can do. So again, find companies who do that because that's your step into the cybersecurity world. But at the same time, I have never seen another industry that have so many open events. Yeah. We have open security summit, we have OWASP, we have the B sites everywhere in the world that are open. Everywhere you look, there's a security event that's mainly open yeah. and then you can attend and build those networking and uh, community. If you were in HR, I, I've never seen a HR summit. I don't know if they are. They are, they are. I don't know, <laughs> I've never seen one. We are an open community. We, we are frightened to be here, but we love to talk. And we love to talk about security all the time, every time. So approach one of us um, in these events, build that community and um, present. We were scared to present, by the way. We are scared to be here. So. Yeah, go on meetup. Meetup.com has lots of free events. And I really want to thank you for asking the question as well. Yeah, thank you for your answer. And uh, to one of the next um, sessions as well, is always mentoring and you can get mentoring early in your career, even if you haven't started working yet. And that can help you as well at certain points. There are online platforms, people from here as well, ask to be mentored. And yeah, more on this, stay tuned. Next sessions. And I'm, I'm gonna, oh, we have one more question, all right. Hello, uh, I'm Steve Hayes from uh, Holland and Barris, actually. Uh, but I was just asking, going to ask a question for the panel, and that is as CISOs, uh, how do you sleep at night? Because there are all these potential threats and actually you can't be across everything. How do you make sure that you are as robust as you can be? Because actually, you know, you're open to the Wild West when your, your business puts itself out there. So how do you do it? You know, how do you stay secure and safe, even in your own mind? I'm not a CISO yet, but <laughs> yeah. I'll, I, I, I do it this way. I've gone through lots of therapies, uh, <laughs> and now I only focus on the things that I can control. And if I know I'm doing my best, then I sleep well. It's a hard question, very hard question. CISO is a very unique job title and very unique responsibility within the company. The other one I will say is similar, but doesn't have that element of incident is the chief risk officer because they deal with risk. But the CISO, you're responsible for things that the company doesn't even understand that you're responsible for. Um, any likely, unlikely or likely event that you are breached, because you are going to get breached, is just when and if you are the CISO of the company at the time. Um, all that goes through your head every day. It's just how much do you decide to offload that risk to the business? But depending on the stage of the business, they might not understand risk. So you might have to go to sleep thinking this is on you, right? and how much level of stress do you want to carry to bed with you? What kind of personality you are? How much do you care if you get breached? Now, there's two sides of getting breached. One is your personal reputation that's associated with that breach. And the second is how much do you care, actually care for the company and your role in that company? I'm a person that doesn't sleep very well. I get three hours sleep a night. And it's because I am vested in everything that I do. So I'm always trying to solve the bigger puzzle. I'm always trying to help the business be as best and operate as best as they can. A lot of therapy, a lot of talks with random people and vet during pub time, but it's not an easy job. If you really a CISO and you take that role with the responsibility that job, that job title has, there's a lot of stress associated with that. And you have to understand when you go for those roles, that's the kind of job that you're going for. It's very unique. I've never seen another role like that apart from uh, medicine that you're looking at things and the impact to the company 
is massive, but the company doesn't know that. 90% of the time, the company doesn't know how important your role is for the company until it's time, until there's a breach and until you are at the door and the new CISO comes in. That must, be, that must be adding to the stress because they don't even know. Exactly. And you feel that on your shoulders. Yes. So I think you should make them know a little bit more. So 50% of the CISO role is actually having the conversations and trying to convince them the importance of your role and the compute, uh, the importance of your role to the business. Why you're doing this is not to say we are secure. My goal is not to secure the company, it's to make sure that the company still operates, and still be able to drive revenue in. And each risk to the company is a potential loss that I'm trying to prevent. So my importance to the company is a lot more than they realize. But those conversations are difficult to have. And that adds to the stress. But you need to be, as a CISO, you need to be willing and wanting to have those difficult conversations. You can't take it as I'm going to join a company and be the CISO and not have the stress. I don't think I've ever met a CISO that basically says, yeah, there's no stress. Everything's nice, rosy. I go to bed at six o'clock in the afternoon and I wake up and go to work. Um, what I'd say is I'm not a CISO either, so I'm just not experienced the full stress yet. But uh, meditating and... Um, uh, and, and a hobby are quite important. You need to have something to be able to shut your brain down before you go to bed or before you do everything to focus on something else. And at the end of the day, you're going to think, did I do the best that I could do for the day? And if you're happy with what you've done and you put the effort and you have a team you can rely on and you can say, okay, if things go wrong, we can, I've worked with Myers before. So we had incidents and we were giggling during the incidents. I know I could, I could rely on people, you know, and even on an incident, somebody has my back. And then I believe we can go through problems and through breaches and through everything. So, so yeah. Yeah. So I actually think that a lot of security professionals, they buy a lot of risk and they are very illogical about it. Right. And I, th I think you have, I think you have to separate the not caring with buying stress. I think that's a very big distinction. I would argue that I care tremendously for the organization that I work for. I, you know, go out of my way, but I'm not stressed, right? It's quite interesting. I get more stressed when I'm doing stuff that I don't want to be doing or I don't, I, I'm fighting the system. So the first thing I say when I hit the board, I say, I'm not here to make you secure. I'm here to make you safe. That's a very big difference. I'm not here to prevent incidents. I'm here to prevent crisis. It's a big difference, right? And so, and, and if you're an organization that is going to fire the CISO because there's a breach, then it's already the wrong organization. Then you're just a figurehead. Right now, the reason the CISO should be fired is if the CISO re misrepresent stress, so misrepresent risk to the business. That's wrong. But if you are straight with the business, you say, this is where we are, this is the situation, this is the gaps that we have, and this is the risk that we're buying. If you get compromises because those risks materialize, if anything, you know, you just showed your credibility, right? Now, there's an argument to be said where you make priorities, and that's important, that's your call. If you make the wrong calls, then probably you shouldn't be there, right? But by the way, like once you go above a certain level, stress, well, pressure comes with the job, right? Like the CTO has a huge amount of pressure, the, head, the vice president of technology, whatever role you are comes with responsibility. But I do think that, and a lot of people, even on my team and other teams, they, they get instantly stressed. I'm like, why? Why are you stressed? That, that problem was not caused by us. It was a division that decided to go freaking 100 miles an hour. They caused the problem. We're trying to make it better. Why are you buying the stress on behalf of that individual? We should be giving that individual the pressure. We should tell that business owner, by the way, you're the one freaking rolling the dice for the business here. We, we're the ones trying to make this better. But if you, in a way, if we hide that risk, if we hide that stress from the business, that's when I think we're not doing the right job. You know, our job is to make sure that the risk is owned at the right altitude. And if you do that, then, you know, you have a much more zen in your life. And, and I think the fact you say, you, you know, you're, you're, not, you're in a good space in, in the incident. I think that shows a lot, of, a lot of maturity in the process. You don't want people handling incidents freaking out, super stressed. You know, that's, that's not good. Right. If you're not calm, like I don't want to be in an operating table when the freaking doctor right is stressed out of his mind. Right. 
I, I want some dude who's listening to music, who's grooving, who's kind of like in control where the operating key, you know, I so I've been watching Great Anatomy with my kid, right? So maybe that's not real world, but, um, but I, I think it's important, right? Like the, you know, job is stressful because there's a lot of stuff on the line, but, but you have to put the, the, you know, you have to see what causes, what, what's the reason over that stress. And I think, I actually think that if you're in a job and you highly stressed, change jobs, right? Like literally life's too short, right? You need to have a good, you know, um, what's it called? Uh, life balance. Now, you can work 20 hours a day and have a good life work balance, right? Just be clear, last, last year I was coding in my holidays, right? But I was happy as a freaking bunny, right? I was on the beach, I was grooving, I was developing, I was creating amazing technology, right? I was spending time with my family. Okay, maybe I didn't went so much to the, to the sea or did a couple of things, but I was there for them, right? And you know, I was reading a book, I was coding and yes, some days I was doing 12 hours a day, 20 hours a day, but I didn't feel stress. And other times I've, I've done five hours work and I was, you know, I was unhappy. So work-life balance is sometimes is not how many hours you work, it's your state of mind and your stress. And when you stress, you don't think right, you don't eat right, you don't look after your body, you're not in a good place. And, and then you make bad decisions. So my metric is always, are, am I or my team making bad decisions? So I measure stress by how much, what is the percentage of bad decisions that you're doing and how irritable you are, et cetera. But if you're in a job that makes you stress, you should think twice because again, life's too short for it. Right? And look at this, sorry. And, and it's a high stakes game, right? But you have to be clear headed because if you're not clear headed, you're gonna make the wrong decisions. And, and to be honest, what the senior execs want from you is a, is control is a plan like if you it's kind of like you know the, the when the manager goes to the to the tv and says my job is safe and the board supports me that guy is going to be sacked the next week right because this is in football right because you know that if you have to keep justifying if you are stressed that's what the management looks like so if you are in a place of control and you, 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 you have a good relationship with your management team, then they have your back, right? And it's all about managed expectations. And an instance will happen. And that's why in my teams, I take a P2, I run them as a P1. I take a P3, I run as a P1 because I don't want us to be headless chickens when shit is a fan. And if, if shit is a fan, you want to be the most proactive, the most effective. You, you know, I, I had the CFO once tell me that, Okay, it was an incident, it was stressful, but I felt like I had the FBI and the CIA on my back because they were working for me, it was, it was awesome. And that's what I wanted to hear. And I said, see, that's why we're expensive, right? But- uh, And um, on that so, note, there you go. <laughs> we're gonna end because we all run. <laughs> I think on that note, <laughs> we can end. Okay, cool. Because we all run. <laughs> yeah, we all run. Cool, so thanks for, yeah. <laughs> for, uh, for this. So, by the way, so the idea now here, so I think we could probably do 10 minutes, right? 15 minutes gap, right? 10 minutes break. Okay, so, <laughs> okay. so what, what we want to do is, and uh, this is for the on-site event. As you see, there's three tables here. So we're going to do this twice, because the idea of the, actually, I don't think